So welcome everybody to my talk about uncertainty quantification in AI. Before I start, a few words about myself. I'm a principal data scientist at Innovex. Innovex is an IT project house, medium-sized, like we are 350 employees. And being a mathematician, my like main activities are mathematical modeling, so somehow translating practical use cases into the language of mathematics to then eventually solve them. I'm also a big fan of like putting things really to production, so not just stopping at some proof of concept, but really showing the value of machine learning of data science by putting by deploying it and uh, gaining then more revenue or some things. Also, other um, like special interests I have, I really like um, everything about recommender system, which is a, a hot topic nowadays. Also, uncertainty quantification, of course. This is why I'm here. Lately, also causality, because I think those two points, uncertainty quantification, causality will be and become much more important in the future. I'm also a fan of the Python data stack, of course, that's why I'm here. And I'm a maintainer of a little project of my own, Pi Scaffold. So if you ever want to like set up your own project in a standardized way to, to package your project, to ship it, then please have a look at Pi Scaffold. So the work I'm going to present today is uh, actually not my work, but it's the work of one of my students. So he mainly did all um, of it. And he, um, yeah, I was supervising him in a master thesis. Now he's an, an esteemed colleague of mine. And he's also written a really cool blog post about this. And if you want to get even more, more details, you can even download his master thesis. So he's a mathematician, a little bit shy. This is why he's not here. I am. I just like to go to conferences. So, um, this is, um, the ground we're going to cover today, first going to start with the motivation. So why should you actually care about uncertainty quantification, what it's all about and why it's important? Then I'm going to present different methods. Um, different, we're going to start with something like really mathy, like Gaussian processes. If you have been to some of the other talks yesterday, you heard already a lot about Gaussian processes. So we're going to use this as a baseline, then compare to four other methods which are more based on, on deep learning approaches. We're going to evaluate those um, five methods um, together in some experiments to show the pro pros and cons of each of those methods and some quantitative uh, qualitative rule of thumb when to apply which. And of course, in the end, some short wrap up and conclusion. So let's start with the motivation. So you surely all know those nice deep learning classification neural networks where you put in some some image and then you end up with a classification if it's a cat, a dog, a hot dog or whatever. And you might wonder actually, so yeah, the guy is talking about uncertainty quantification as if it's something new, but actually already here in those networks, we have some probabilities, right? We have the softmax layers, we get those probabilities, and in case of this cat, it's 90%, so it seems to work. If we put in another picture, maybe of this dog, the, the network is a little bit less certain about it. But what actually happens if we put something completely different in there, some kind of image we have never trained on, some compute, uh, some complete new class like a bird? So in this case, you might assume that the network will tell you something like 50% a dog, 50% a cat, in a way telling you, I have never seen anything like this before. But actually what might happen that you end up having 70% cat or 80% a dog. So it's not, it's not guaranteed what kind of, what kind of results you're going to get. So you could get anything because there was never an image only uh, like similar to this in your training set and the network has no way of telling you I'm completely uncertain about the outcome so please don't rely on my on my outcome on my prediction and I mean it's all yeah fun and games if we are talking only about classification of cats and dogs but you might think that if you do autonomous driving and if you have a classification like this for traffic signs, then it becomes really important that um, if you put in some pictures that are not a traffic sign, that somehow your um, your classification model has a way of telling you. So I'm not I'm not certain what it is. And 
just doesn't give you just some random um, answer. And so why is this so? Why doesn't it work? So um, beginning of the year, I heard a really cool talk about the intuition about this at the Triple AI. Um, the paper is called Learning and the Unknown. And in this case, um, it was, there was given an example of four different classes, like those four colors. And it, what does a deep neural network do? I mean, a deep neural network, we have all learned that you kind of, it helps you do the feature engineering. It, um, it finds some, some internal latent space. But in the end, a neural network, a deep neural network does something really simple in this internal representation that is shown here, it still finds those decision boundaries. Like here, the circles would be the training is examples, and we have these decision boundaries. And within these decision boundaries, it will give you a high uh, certainty about a, um, an instance being in this class if it's far away from this decision boundary. So this is all fine if you end up with the instance you want to predict somewhere around here. But in case like with our bird, what happened? We somewhere ended up completely far away. So we just zoomed out in the right picture and we ended up somewhere in this open space. And due to the fact how a neural network is constructed in case of a classification, those decision boundaries go up until infinity. So if you land somewhere in this open space with some new instance, you might get a really high certainty that you are in the green class, for instance, but actually you are not. You're just um, somewhere completely different. And um, so this is for, for classification problem, but still you have those, those probabilities in case of this uh, softmax. But it's actually even worse if we look at another a problem if you look at uh, regression problems. For instance, here I uh, or we we made a, a simple 1D function. We generated some some observations. Those are the crosses, and we let a neural network learn um, the the interpolation of this um, of these data points. And you see that the the fit it looks quite well, right? So it. Um, we chose a uh, mean squared error to, to minimize, so we will end up having a kind of mean. But already looking at this, you see that we only, for each uh, point, we get only a single function value, right? So the deep learning network it just has one output. So we have no notion of the fact that somehow there seems to be noise in our data, right? So here, so two uh, or three or four points which are really close in its its point they are quite different in the function value so the network is not showing us this uncertainty it's just giving us a single point and we're going to hear in the next presentation for instance that if you want to do some optimization with the results you're going to need um, the whole distribution and not only uh, a single data point so this is the, the interpolation case. So we had data from 0 to 10. But now what happens if we look beyond this interval? So again, like in the classification problem, what happens if we look um, beyond the, our data points? So what the network does is it just gives us some results. And due to the fact that we cho uh, chose the, the ReLU activation function, you know, the ReLU is uh, linear. Um, for positive numbers. So this network will come up with any kind of, of linear function beyond the point 10 and below uh, zero. If we compare this to the actual true function, then of course it's completely different. I mean, how would it know otherwise? How, how, how can it know? But again, um, the main point is the network did not tell us that it's completely unsure. And in the, in the interval, it's worked quite well, but outside you just end up with random number. And this is something, um, you don't want to have in a production system, for instance, because if this was multidimensional, you could not as clearly see that you are now in a region where you had no data points, right? So what we rather would like to have is a network that gives us something like this, like, confidence intervals, like those shaded areas are 0 0.5 um, sigma standard deviations in each direction, and that we could get something like this, because then we would see, okay, here 
between zero to 10, there is, this is the mean, but we have some, some random noise in the data. And, um, this is some, some, these are the confidences we have about, um, our prediction. And if we go outside this region, we see, okay, we are getting more and more uncertain as we move away from our trainings data. So now implicitly, We've already talked about two kinds of uncertainty, and I want to define those. So first of all, this intrinsic noise is called aleatoric noise. So this is the noise due to the fact how you might measure the data. Maybe you have some measurement errors. Maybe you also um, just don't have each covariate, for instance. So let's assume you're shooting an arrow and you have all the data about your angle, the thrust, how far your target is away, and so on. You have all the data that you could physically like, um, like use Newton or whatever to, to calculate um, where the arrow is going to hit the target. But if you do the same, um, if you shoot the same way twice, you will still have little noise because due to the let's say wind or whatever different pressure in the air and if this is if is if this is something you cannot measure then you will have some kind of intrinsic noise and this is the aleatoric noise and the most important thing to remember about the aleatoric noise if we collect more of the same data then we are, will not be able to to decrease aleatoric noise. In contrast to that, we have the so-called epistemic noise. So this is noise due to the fact that we lack certain knowledge, that we lack data, that we lack knowledge about the underlying process. And this is something we can, of course, improve if we gather more data. And in some uses cases, you could imagine, it makes even sense to be able to to split your uncertainty into an aleatoric part into an epistemic part because if the aleatoric if you only have aleatoric noise and you know the 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 noise is still too big for your use case the uncertainty is too high then you might try and look again maybe you need more covariates you're missing some features whatever or let's say the other way around you have a lot of epistemic noise then of course you would just try and gather more data at these points so now let's uh, let's talk about uh, the methods. So what can we use to actually accomplish this? We're going to start um, with the baseline, the Gaussian processes. They are like really mathematical. And then as we go on, we're going to relax on different mathematical assumptions. We're going to um, ignore distributions and so on. Um, as we go away and uh, the methods itself become, I would say, more and more heuristic, especially with the Monte Carlo drops, uh, dropouts. But let's first start off with something more mathematical with the Gaussian processes. So I'm going to give you only like a really small like intuition what a Gaussian process is, maybe or raise your hand who knows what a Gaussian process is already. Okay, so quite a lot. So to um to give a repetition so um a gaussian process is a is a kind of distribution and if you would normally think of some some random variable if you pull one sample from a random variable you end up having a number or vector or whatever but if you ask for a sample from a gaussian of a gaussian process you end up having a whole function so this is the is the the difference and a function so what's really fascinating is i mean a function has a kind of infinite number of points right so you have a lot of points and a lot of function values so how does the gaussian process accomplish this that it gives you back a whole function so actually you're never practically dealing with infinite number of points, right? So for a function, for us, it's enough to have a finite number of points, a finite number of fun function values. And there comes now the relation of a Gaussian process to a normal distribution in, because if you ask the Gaussian process for um, the, the, for a finite number of, of points, then it will give you back a normal distribution. And then, um, yeah, we are back at something we know. So the normal distribution in a, in a, a multidimensional case has a mean vector and a covariance matrix. And since we 
could ask the Gaussian process for any kind of points. We have to kind of generate those vectors and this matrix um, for all kinds of points. So this is why we have functions here. So it's a kind of, I see it as a kind of generalization of a, of a, of a normal distribution. And so, as I said, we have, instead of a mean vector, we have a mean function and um, covariance function, um, which gives us then some covariance matrix given um, some points. And uh, the, the things we kind of put in there, in this Gaussian process, if we set something up, like like the prior information is, for instance, if we are looking for functions that have a certain trend or um, if we are looking for functions that are really smooth. So if we want to express the notion that if two points, when they are close together, the function values should really highly likely be also close together, then this is something we can encode into the covariance function. But um, a picture says more than a thousand words, so it's actually clear um, if we look at some examples. Let's take this exponential um, covariance function, and you can see um, that um, this would generate really smooth function, because if this is really close, then the covariance between two points is really, really high. And... Um, if we now take just the zero function for the mean, and this is how a Gaussian process would, would, would look like the distribution. So again, we have, um, we have, um, for the shadings, we have the, like, yeah, like a visualization of the distribution. And those colored lines are just random samples from this distribution. And the dashed line is, is the mean. If we, somehow know that we are rather looking for functions with the trend, then this would be, um, we could, for instance, choose this mean function and um, have a distribution that looks like this. So far, I've only talked about like how to, how to um, come up with um, Gaussian um, process, um, yeah, how to construct it, how to put a priori knowledge into it. So far, we have not seen any data. So you might wonder how does now inference work? So let's assume I have some data points. Um, what happens now? So again, this is like the if we have no data at all, so it's the prior, let's assume we get um, three different data points here, there, and there. And now we can, like, due to the fact that we um, are dealing internally with a lot of normal distributions and they have a lot of nice properties, so we can just condition on those points and uh, calculate the posterior. And then our distribution looks like this, so the resulting posterior. So in this case, just for illustration, I chose a perfect interpolation. So we see that now the mean function just, yeah, interpolates those, um, uh, those given data points. We also see to the effect of the covariance function that, um, if we go in the middle between two points, then the, the uncertainty is quite high. And as we go closer to one of the points, the uncertainty becomes small. And again, the colored lines are just now random sam samples. This also works, of course, with noisy observations. I mean, this is something how we do, how we would do it in, in, uh, in practice. And there we see then that, um, there's still uncertainty even we, uh, if we have a point, um, here. And there, and for instance, here we had like put four points, uh, f yeah, four data points at eight. So you see that the uncertainty is smaller than, for instance, here. Um, so just to show you a little formula how this looks like. So um, the axis would be your data, the data we are having, and x star would be the data points where we want to evaluate the function. So this is kind of where we want to do our predictions. And the only important thing to actually notice here are those two terms because because they are really computationally intensive. So if you remember maybe your, your computer science classes or whatever, if you have to invert a matrix, this has cubic uh, complexity. And if um, this covariance matrix is as big as your uh, as the number of data points you have, then it is completely unfeasible 
um, if you are doing anything related to big data. So there are different ways how to get around it, but this is seen as like the major drawback of Gaussian processes because, um, yeah, for small data uh, problems, they actually work really, really well. And if I kind of, um, yeah, get your interest on this, if you want to read more about Gaussian processes, um, then there's really cool tutorials of uh, Christopher Fonsbeck. Uh, he has some really nice talks about it and how you can do this with PyMC which is a really cool library, by the way. So this Gaussian process, as I said, we're going to use this later as a kind of baseline, a mathematical baseline to compare the other methods to. And now to the first, like, deep learning-based approach, how to get uncertainty quantification. You all might know the dropout technique, right? Dropout is a way that is used in most modern machine le uh, deep learning models to regularize your um, your network. So it works by randomly activating and deactivating certain nodes during the training time. And this like intuitively like spreads the information more over the whole network instead of being just local. And um, yeah, helps to generalize during training time. And the idea of this paper was of 2016 ICML was, okay, what if we don't just use this during draining time? What if we also use this during prediction time? Meaning what happens if we, um, if we do a prediction with a new value here, we also randomly activate and deactivate um, the internal nodes and run this a hundred times and then we'll get a hundred different outputs and of these hundred different outputs we can do just uh, things like calculating a mean, calculating a standard deviation to give us an uncertainty, right? And the idea is if the network is quite sure then having dropout during prediction should give us an, almost the same values while um, if it's really unsure then it should, good have, should give us a wide spread of values. So this is um, the basic idea already um, of Monte Carlo dropout. So if you train this you have to be a little bit careful if you also do weight decay because this um, this probability of uh, making a dropout um, will play a role in this formula, but all the details are also in the, in the master thesis. So this was like the first approach. Another approach is how you can achieve uncertainty quantification is called deep ensembles. It's from a NIPS paper of 2017. Um, here, the basic idea is what if we don't take a neural network that has only a single output, like normally? But what if we would try to generate a whole distribution? And how do you get a distribution? You fit the parameters of a distribution, like uh, in the case of a normal distribution, the mean and the variance. And um, then, of course, in practice, you're going to ask yourself, okay, I got a single value as a target uh, point. How would I now kind of fit the standard deviation? I mean, this is something I don't have in my data. But uh, it turns out if you just look at the uh, negative log likelihood of your normal distribution, you can just use a custom loss function. So you would not just un uh, use a mean squared error, but you can use this to actually fit it. And what we see here, we got some mean squared error um, here. And um, we kind of... If the network says that the uh, standard deviation um, is, uh, the variance is really high, then this becomes low. But on the other hand, this term then becomes high. So you got this, both terms kind of fighting each other. And uh, this is how it eventually finds good parameters for normal distribution and fits it. So this already sounds good, like, okay, we have a way to fit a distribution so we get some uncertainty, but it turns out that the variance is quite high um, if you do it like this. Um, First of all, you have to be careful um, how you train, so you cannot regularize with dropout. You can do something like adv adversarial training, like f finding new data points that are really close to your original data points, doing pseudo data points, and so on. Um, but still, you will get a high variance in dependence of your initial initialization of your weights. 
So this is where the, the ensemble part comes in. So what the paper suggested is that you do this now, like really, yeah, with many, many networks. Um, let's say five to 10 or 20 networks, you train them and you get a lot of uh, different parameters for your normal distribution and then you just average them again. So this is the basic idea. This is where the sample comes in. Of course, then you decrease your, your variance again in your estimation of this. And um, as you already see, if I got to, to train uh, many networks, then this becomes computationally really uh, intense. And uh, this is why Simon, so the master student, came up with a cool idea. So what if we now combine the two uh, methods, the Monte Carlo and the Deep Ensemble method, and just call it dropout ensembles, basically um, taking a single network of the Deep Ensembles, but instead of having that multiple times, what if we just think of each instance in this ensemble is just another dropout configuration. And uh, by this, we will also get different uh, means and different variances. And we can do the calculation of those uh, central means and central uh, standard deviations again. So this was kind of um, where, what, what he came up in his math thesis as an additional uh, beneficial suggestion. So as the really uh, last method, I'm going to show a really easy one. So quantile regression, which can also be done uh, with the help of neural networks. And it's a really uh, simple method, um, but um, yeah, works surprisingly well. So again, to explain what this method does, uh, what is again a cumulative distribution function, I've given here the definition. So you're kind of given some point, you're kind of looking for the probability tau that um, they are um, showing up points in your uh, random distribution that are below or equal a point. And the quantile is actually just the inverse function. So given some, some tau, some probability, you try to find that point uh, y so that this equation is fulfilled. And you might wonder, okay, so how if we're given that, um, if I want to find the quantile function, and I mean, if you have the quantile, of course, you could perfectly um, uh, measure and quantize your uncertainty because you know everything about distribution if you choose different tiles. And you might wonder, okay, how can I use now some just neural network to actually um, fit these values? And this is um, um, quite easy, as it turns out. So you just take a custom loss function. And um, what's special about a loss function that it makes a difference between kind of a right error and a left error. So if my estimation of um, the quantile is below the actual value or above the actual value. And then another distinguishing point is that we don't have like normal some squared error or something nonlinear. So we have... Um, at least like something piecewise linear here, we just take the, the absolute value. And then we do some weightings between those left and right arrows. So um, for me, actually, to be honest, when I first saw it, it was kind of, okay, this really works. And um, yeah, I'm going to show you in some simple example that it's uh, actually really easy. So if we if we take, for instance, the median, so 0 0.5, then tau would be 0 0.5 here and here, so we can just ignore it for a moment. So how this would look like now in 1D, let's assume we have four points at 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.5, and 0 0.8, and we assume that our median is here, wrongly, then we would have those four um, errors. Um, yeah, so... 2.0102 02 and so on. And since um, we call this now kind of right-hand side errors because um, the error is in this 1D example on the right side. And the error is in total 1.6. So the, some back propagation would maybe tell us, okay, we got to move on a little bit higher. Let's say we move on to 0 0.1. In this case, we decrease the error four times. We have four data points by our step width, which was 0 
and um, we end up having 1.2. Still not right, so we go on one more point, and now we see that what happens is that from here to there we decreased by 0 0.3, but increased now. We have now the the, the left left-hand side error, and we are basically also um, done here. Um, if we since we have now an even number of points, so any so according to our minimization function, any point between those two will do um, for a median. So the interesting thing, and now the actual intuition comes in, if we go on one step further, and you see that between those two slides, what happens as we increase the error on the right-hand side by decrease by 0 0.1, we directly increase it. So this is this piecewise linear of the, of the absolute value. And so we are just trying to find points, to find a point where there is the same amount of data points on the left hand side as there is on the right hand side. And now comes in the weighting. So if we would now assume the 75 percentile, then um, we can just accomplish this by weighting the right hand side error more than the left hand side error. So in our case, it would be three times. And that means to get this like tipping point as we've had before, we would need to jump somewhere in this region because now as this arrow weights three times, then it's equal to this arrow. And this is the whole intuition why this quantile um, regression actually works. Now to the experiment to compare those methods, we took um, a, a function from a, from another, uh, from a PhD thesis actually that someone suggested to evaluate. So the function, the weekly function that you've seen before. And, um, uh, we generated, uh, the data points, um, with, uh, uh, 0 0.5, um, standard deviation and, um, yeah, generate a different number of points and let this, let it run. Here again is our, um, data set. Um, with the, uh, um, yeah, this is, uh, five sigma in total confidence interval and the mean. And, um, for all our, um, methods, which are based on, on deep learning methods, we chose two hidden layers with 20 relu uh, neurons, five networks only for the deep ensembles because it already took quite a while to, to train. Um, for all the different uh, experiments and their variations, 100 iterations to make in this dropout, the different um, predictions for each point, and uh, Adam Edimizer, and of course we um, chose the best hyperparameter for each of the methods to be fair. For the Gaussian processes, we used the squared exponential covariance function you've seen before. And um, also this, um, yeah, there was done some hyperparameter hyper optimization to get the right aleatoric noise. So if you want to compare something, of course, you uh, might think, okay, what kind of uh, error functions, what metrics you want to look at. And uh, first of all, we have the mean squared error um, in the pen, uh, for, the, for the mean and the standard deviation. Then we looked at the mean negative log likelihood. So this is the function that uh, the deep ensemble method is directly trying to, to minimize and the mean kullback liber divergence because this is also often use, used. Um, so what were the results? Um, so especially for um, the metrics with the mean squared error, so how good our mean actually is and the uh, uh, standard deviation um, as well as the mean kullback leibler divergence, we see what was uh, cool to see um, being a mathematician, of course, that the, the baseline, the, the Gaussian process uh, was much better than the other ones. Um, but if you go for a deep learning method, then the deep uh, ensemble, which was also computationally quite intense, um, turned out to be the best for the interpolation experiments. So you might wonder, how does it now look? Did we achieve our goal? I mean, we wanted to have um, interpolation and extrapolation. So just by looking um, with the eye, so interpolation 
looks good. I mean, this were the numbers shown before, but extrapolation, the Monte Carlo dropout, um, at least what we wanted is as we move away, the uncertainty increases. This is also with the deep ensembles and, um, with the, with the dropout ensembles and the quantile regression. But somehow in our example, they really all had problems in this like narrow arm of the function because here they definitely underestimate the increase in uncertainty. So at this, uh, at these regions. Mm -hmm. And, uh, what's, what you can also see is all the dropout methods. You have this, this kind of, uh, chick, um, mean. So this is due to this, um, that you have the, the, the dropout and also the, the, um, uncertainty, the confidence intervals. They look kind of strange in those kinds of methods. So for the deep ensembles, like, only qualitatively looking, it looks quite well, and the uh, quantile regression. If you comp compare this to the Gaussian process, so this is actually what I would have liked uh, to see also for the um, for the deep learning based models, because here you see directly, okay, we are moving away from the 10 and the Gaussian process by its definition goes back to its uh, prior, so you end up um, being in a complete like uninformed state, um, you might say, okay, this is kind of unfair because this is some a priori knowledge that we've put in there. But in many use cases, you have this knowledge. And then it's nice to see that, um, yeah, um, that this does exactly what you want it to do. Talking a little bit about um, like how efficient this the whole thing is how data efficient i mean as you we have here in the y and the x axis the number of data points and uh, one of the measures the KL divergence and um the the gaussian process needs only little data to be quite good actually and then kind of like levels out um the um deep learning based models like quantile regression deep ensembles the more data you give the better it gets like typical for deep learning methods what we found quite interesting is um that um all the dropout based methods they kind of improve up to a certain point but then hit a barrier and go on so we assume this is due to the fact that there is this dropout. I mean, it gets also some noise into the prediction that might be unwanted. And then one would have maybe to play a little bit more with the fact that maybe in, in lower levels, you want a different dropout rate than in higher levels. And of course, then it becomes really um, problematic to optimize. Um, but yeah, this is something we found. Okay. It's, uh, not behaving so nicely there. How about heteroscedastic noise? So what happens if the noise changes throughout the function? This is also, uh, something you might have. Then Gaussian processes are quite bad because, I mean, they, the, one of the assumption is that it's homoscedastic. So if you, if you, um, um, yeah. If you don't adhere to this, um, to this assumption, then, uh, it becomes quite bad. In this case, deep ensemble could still, um, handle the situation quite well. How about, uh, non-Gaussian noise? Here we chose, uh, exponential noise. Um, there was not that much of a difference between the different methods. So I would actually would have expected that the Gaussian process, um, is much worse in this case. Because it also, I mean, it has a normal distribution as one of its assumptions, but in this example, it worked quite well. And another thing I just want to mention. So why did I give all this, um, uncertainty, uh, split, uh, definitions about aleatoric and epistemic noise? Um, the cool thing about the ensemble methods is that you can now do a split like this. Um, you can, um, like split up the, 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 this averaging of the, um, of the different, um, parameters of your, uh, normal distribution into an aleatoric part and into an epistemic part. And this gives you then, um, confidence interval of your aleatoric and your epistemic nodes. And this is really cool because, for instance, we see here that in the, during the, uh, in the interpolation, the epistemic noise is actually kind of zero. 
Um, the aleatoric noise is um, is blue, so we might be happy at that region in a practical use case, for instance. But here it's just the other way around. Here the epistemic grows, and this could tell us in some use case, okay, please get more data for this region to improve our uncertainty. So to sum the whole thing up, um, if we just maybe look at the columns, so my kind of takeaway after this master thesis was that if I have a small or medium sized uh, data set, I would definitely, and I can make the assumption that I got some homoscedastic noise. So if I can assume the normal distribution and um, that it's not, not changing, then I would definitely go for Gaussian uh, processes because they're only really bad if you have a lot of data and you also can get this nice uncertainty split that I just showed before. Um, if it really has to be big data and if you have a lot of compute power that you can parallelize, then deep ensembles, they sh work also really pretty well. Um, but as I said, the computation is really intense. The quantile regression is a really, really simple method. So if you have like no time and um, you don't have as much compute resources and you don't care about the uncertainty split, then you could go for this method. It's uh, really easy to implement. And uh, the dropout methods, they are mathematically really interesting. So I yeah, uh, suggest you to, to read the papers because they even have a nice link to the, uh, that this dropout, um, uh, this Monte Carlo dropout. So this paper that they have a nice link that you could even think of this as a deep uh, Gaussian process. So there is an interesting paper, but practically we found the results not really convincing and the own methods um, that uh, yeah, like uh, we came up during the master thesis is also quite um, uh, yeah it's also quite quite nice it has the uncertainty split but in some cases um, yeah it's, it's kind of comparable to the Monte Carlo so I want to um, conclude um, just the the, the last uh, two slides so our conclusion is that you can do uncertainty quantification also with deep learning based method, especially if you're looking for the aleatoric uncertainty. They are not really capable by estimating epistemic uncertainty. We saw this in a simple 1D example. And I mean, in practice, you're going to have like multi-dimensional spaces. And if it doesn't work in 1D, it will not work in, in, in higher dimensions. So be careful with this. Uh, Gaussian process, on the other hand, are really cool. And I think maybe in some cases, you should rather use them instead of using just some, some deep neural, ne neural network. And of course, a Bind solution would be really great because we're going to need uncertainty quantification. Three things we haven't really looked into but want to look into are Bayesian neural networks. So the case when each weight in your neural networks are um, distributions on their own. Then there is sparse Gaussian process approximation. This is kind of a trick how you can do Gaussian processes on, on, on big data. So instead of like using each data point, you come up with a good set of supporting points and this kind of relieves you from the fact of inverting a huge covariance matrix and then there's also Gaussian process on top of neural networks this is something where I also need to read up more um, so this is something we would like to um, look into so um, I hope uh, you learned a little bit um, about uh, uncertainty quantification in AI thanks for your um, attention and um, yeah, I'm happy to hear your questions. Thank you, Florian, for this nice talk. <laughs> so probably we have time just for one small questions, and you can continue discussion probably after. Yeah, of yeah. course. So please, questions. Hi. Uh, Hi. Thanks for the talk. Uh, it might be confidential, but. Uh, for what do you use it in practice or do you use it for anything in practice? Some, some kind of uncertainty estimation for your, yeah, predictions? Yeah, you, in, in cases where you actually, um, yeah, in cases where you do, for instance, a demand forecast and then you kind of, let's say you, 
<laughs> Actually, it will be quite similar to the next talk, but uh, to give a little um, like 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 pre-spoiler, um, if you do a demand and then you actually don't care just about the prediction what the demand will be tomorrow, right? If you are the the, the person like um, needing to decide how many apples or let's say sushi is needed the next day in a store. Right. And someone would give you just a regression would say, well, confidence interval, um, you might need uh, f like 50 to 70 apples. And this is the distribution. So what would you do with this now? So you would actually um, need to run some optimization on this. So, OK, so to say it the other way around, if a normal neural network would just tell you with a mean, um, you need 70 apples tomorrow. This is not, you would not order 70 apples because maybe it is like this that if you have too many apples, then um, you have to throw them away, but this costs you less than if someone buys an apple. So you have an asymmetric uh, like cost function. And if someone gives you only a single point, you cannot really apply this cost function that it's for you better to actually have a little bit more apples than, uh, than less apples. And if uh, you want to optimize this, then you can, um, you need a distribution. And this is then the case when uh, our customers ask us for methods that give them whole distributions um, and this is basically so a lot of it, it's mostly about uh, demand forecasting for um, yeah for retailers okay so thank you let's thank the speaker again